And it's a real privilege for me to uh, interview Kate tonight. We've spoken on the phone, but had never met, and it was uh, quite a privilege to meet her in person tonight. It's also, I told her, a time when I'm very nervous. This is the first time I've really been out in public like this <laughs> in a long time. Yeah. And she told me she was nervous too because her family and her whole high school friends are all here. <laughs> so if she says something that ain't true, the answer will go up. Or people will blame. Really so thank you for coming. Kate, you have written a number of books. And in Everything Happens for a Reason, you wrote about your journey with stage four cancer. And I wonder, how are you doing cancer-wise today? Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of like Smokey the Bear yellow like it's not forest full forest fire or anything anymore so i'm 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 doing okay it's been i mean every year has been a tremendous gift and a surprise to me so i just have a lovely scan this last week and i for which i rejoice but i stay in that kind of tender place of always not exactly when it's gonna happen okay thank you for sharing that and in your memoir no cure for being human you wrote about how life is both hard and beautiful and when you abandon certainty and the illusion of control in your life, that things began to turn around a little bit. And now you've written a devotional book, Good Enough, based on those experiences. So why did you write it? And what do you hope these people will take away from it? I just think I had a moment after I got sick where all the, all the ability to earn anything went away because there just wasn't enough time anymore. And... If it was the fall and I was supposed to die in the spring, there just there, there couldn't be a checklist that would feel faithful enough to like a life I'd hoped to have. And it was also weirdly the time of the most love I've ever felt, loved by others, loved by so many of you in this room who sent me beautiful things and dumb presents I asked for. <laughs> and, and the love of God. Mm -hmm. And when I stopped trying to earn my life. I felt like I had sort of accidentally figured out a secret to the universe I should have known a long time ago. There just wasn't going to be the, the feeling of arriving somewhere that would make my life complete. But the problem is with cancer, I think with just any bit of living is that that feeling goes away and then you start trying to earn your life again. And then you start trying to, at least I just went right back. In fact, because I think I was just been so worried about living, just sort of the speed of my life turned up. I think that's often a pandemic feeling is when we get, when our lives become small, we're so quick to try to make up the difference again. So I wrote good enough because I was trying to figure out how do I get back to that thing I'd learned before where I wasn't, um, where I felt the enoughness of being loved without always trying to, yeah, earn my stupid life. And is the devotional a way for you, because you wrote it, and people who read it to remind themselves you aren't perfect, you won't, you won't be able to do all these things? <laughs> well, um, <laughs> there's, like, yeah, there's like a huge health and wellness industry that's right. defined by the idea that you really are going to get there. <laughs> and all of Instagram is devoted to that purpose. Someone out there is living an amazing life and they cannot wait for you to realize it about them. Um, so I think there's just that always anxious feeling and so much of my research is around. I didn't know how to say when I sort of like applying for money or something somewhere. I'm like, oh, I'm just an, I'm just an anti-self-help person. And you're like, oh gosh, what do you, what do you, what do you want people to do? Nothing? I'm like, Maybe for a minute. Um, but you know, also as Christians, we have a language of sanctification. We're hoping that God will somehow change us. So how do we balance that feeling that we're about to be put into this industrial complex of trying to always make us better and simultaneously accept the divine call to not just be as we were, but to allow life to transform us somehow. So I find that to be like a fun, tricky little place of how do we find that place of change without sort of throwing ourselves back into the perfectibility club. So when you when you sat down and thought, I'll write a devotional, there are lots of devotionals out there. Yes. What makes this? <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> well, <laughs> and how did you convince your publisher? I did. Um, do you want a very sad book about the death of our Lord? Um, well, because I always tend to put my stuff out in the saddest time of year, in like the sort of 
Jesus' roundhouse to his death on the cross. I'm like, it's going to be a great time for publishing everyone. Um, Because mostly these books are designed around an experience of endless progress. Mm -hmm. And I always just feel terrible when I read books like that. It's like, it's Tuesday and I failed Monday spiritual lessons. (laughs) So, and I think honestly, my poor publishers, every first letter, they've taken them out of everything I've tried to write. I always go, dear reader, if you've been given this book, something really terrible must have happened <laughs> in your life. <laughs> so I, I guess for, for good enough, I wanted a book that people could feel encouraged by without feeling like simultaneously they were failing mm-hmm. if they didn't get to week two. <laughs> so you write about the wellness industry, the self-help industry, yeah. and we're, we've all had our, our exchanges and engagements with it. And a lot of people in this room, like myself, grew up in church. I grew up in an evangelical congregation. And I learned at a very young age that all things are possible with Jesus. And if things weren't going so well, and if it wasn't possible, well, whose fault was it anyway? Yeah. It was my fault. And so then I would feel worse, and then you would try to feel better, and then you feel worse. Because you had this constant, never good enough. Yeah. What is it about some aspects of Christianity that end up making us feel worse instead of better. Yeah. It was that feeling of just sort of guilt and then knowing that there was a moment where we were spiritually more mature than we are now. Thank you, Red Rock Bible Camp. For me, my tiny baby face hands. Um, yeah. I think, I know we all know, and we, we feel like we're just, and there's so many kinds of time, right? There's just like, washing dishes time where we're not terribly spiritual and then there's Mm -hmm. saying horrible things about our actual neighbor and that takes up at least two or three days a week (laughs) yeah i think i am it has been it's been hard to figure out what the right christian language is to be grateful like grateful for the ability to feel loved and known and simultaneously not always feel like we're supposed to be in every moment improving. And uh, Sam Wells, he's this lovely, uh, he was the dean of the chapel at uh, Duke, where I work, there's like a giant Gothic chapel right in the middle with like a lot of gargoyles. He was in Mm -hmm. charge of that. That's his body. Um, And he wrote a lovely book recently called uh, Humbler Faith, Bigger God. And in it, he was like, maybe we just need to not emphasize quite so much the God for, God saving God, and the God with, mm. the God who comes alongside, the God who knows, who who is sometimes most known when we have nothing to do for God. And that's certainly how I felt in the hospital, when I just felt so bizarrely loved and there was no way to improve. So I think the God with is one that I'm a little bit more into than the very hyper justification language of the God all for. So do you have uh, opportunity to talk to preachers now and then? Because um, <laughs> <laughs> I have some notes. <laughs> I was once asked to do a sermon at my church many years ago, and yeah. I did a sermon which just said to everyone, you're doing great. And I had to identify all the things people were doing well, oh, and I've never been asked back again. <laughs> so, um, you're doing great. That's awesome. But, but you so seldom hear that. that you almost always hear a sermon about how you could do better. Yeah. And haven't we had enough of yeah. those? Um, maybe we need more of Kate. <laughs> I like the hands. Oh, yeah. Aww. Well, thanks, John. I, I think knowing, um, I think one of the great mysteries of life is, is whether we're, how much we're capable of change. Because most of the Christian stories we get have one very intensely that hyper-perfectionist, or the, because we're always close to springs, wherever I am here in Winnipeg, Manitoba. <laughs> I hope you can hear me. Um, the sense that you're always then supposed to be rewarded for your spiritual efforts. Yes. Feels good, doesn't it? Hometown. <laughs> yeah, thanks guys, I love you so much. <laughs> yeah, I've, I mean, the one where you always are supposed to be able to play show and tell with your life. Mm -hmm. Behold, look at my compliant children. (laughs) Oh, the faithfulness of God. Or the, you know, marriage prosperity gospel. Oh, honey, my soulmate, my everything. Mm -hmm. 
look at us celebrate our anniversary on Facebook and you will think of me. Oh, behold, you are faithful. And so often the, the, the weight of our lives can't carry all this evidence. Mm -hmm. So maybe we need a richer sense of um, being able to be accepting of our own inability to be every and all good thing. Mm -hmm. And to just hope for that gradual little glimmery transformation in which we can at least change one or two terrible things about us before we die. <laughs> Where's the bar? <laughs> you wrote about the perfectibility paradigm, and I'm not sure if you coined that or not. Yeah, I Googled it after, and I was like, I think I got something there. Yeah. <laughs> That's what you got to do. You just yeah. got to Google it later. What is the perfectibility paradigm, and what do we do about it? Yeah, I, that was the... So I, I'm a researcher, so I built these ridiculous databases of things. So I built an insane database of all of the mega churches, for example, that believe that God wants you to be happy, healthy, and wealthy. And I built these ridiculous databases of all the books who are trying to say that you should be perfect by now. And everyone is very disappointed in you in particular. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, and, and it's, it's, the kind of, it's the kind of message that you can get everywhere from Springs or um, <laughs> Goop or every hot yoga studio, you know, where someone like really, really wants to explain manifesting to you. <laughs> At Thermia yesterday, someone did really, really want to explain manifesting to me. And I was like, oh, lovey, you have wandered into the wrong pool. <laughs> There's so much to share. Uh, so happy. Uh, but it's it's the sense that we should we are best loved by others and by God when we are good, better, best. Mm -hmm. And it makes everybody into a televangelist. So my hope is that by allowing a, a different sense of faithfulness and grace for our own imperfections, that we can kind of like your, your strong lower than our hands, mm -hmm. that we can get a richer sense of acceptance for the lives we really have, which are usually mostly just trading places on other people who are in pain. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I have spent so much of the last five years not being able to carry the weight of my own life. Mm -hmm. And mostly that made me feel uh, shame. Mm -hmm. shouldn't, other, shouldn't a good person be independent? Shouldn't a good person not need quite so much? And um, I think our finitude, our ridiculous mortality has taught me more about love and grace than all my years being pretty good mm. at being an overachiever. Mm. So, yeah. But the second I learn it, I do it. Because you can't be like, I'm so humble. <laughs> the second you learn it, I'm not a perfectionist. <laughs> Check. And then you, you just like, unravel the whole thing. <laughs> so what does good enough look like if perfectibility is not something that we should be striving after? I'm really hoping it means interdependence. Mm -hmm. And that, I, honestly, that's something that I've learned mostly from Mennonites, mm -hmm. is they are very good at a group project. <laughs> <laughs> How people do not divorce over construction projects is the greatest proof of God's faithfulness. <laughs> they really are, um, people who have communal mindsets really can have a richer sense that we're not really supposed to just carry our own lives. So I'm really hoping it means um, a thicker sense of community. And that's something that most of us, I mean, it was framed before the pandemic, but now, I mean, the rapid acceleration of, of, um, of the sort of bottoming out of any community organization is making all of us incredibly lonely. Mm -hmm. And loneliness has been one of the great sort of epidemics of the last five to 10 years, mm -hmm. which always just makes us feel like we've just publicly admitted to being unpopular. <laughs> no one wants to hang out with me. You know, and, and then very difficult to, to undo. Um, so I'm hoping it means interdependence. I'm really hoping it means a lot more honesty, just spiritual honesty, friendship, wine club honesty, even hot yoga honesty would be great. Why are we doing this? <laughs> Is it because of the winter? That was my downward dog with hands. Um, <laughs> But I, I am imagining that reimagining our lives as a group project is going to be very countercultural. Canadians are, on the, for the most part, a bit better at it mm. than Americans. But I live in the world of like. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> so you had cancer, and, and as anyone who's been really sick knows, that sickness happens to you and to you alone. You're going to have lots of people around you, but it's your experience. Yeah. But we all had the experience of the pandemic. Yeah, and we're right. coming out of it, we hope, now. What's your message coming out of the pandemic? What, what, what lessons did it teach you? We all have felt inadequate, alone, yeah. not good enough. Yeah. Something beyond our control. That that's a big theme of yours. Yeah, yeah. And you can't do anything about it, and we couldn't. All of us no. for two years. No, and 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 to just be able. I mean, I think the the first thing for at least for to undo like a self help culture. Usually, the first step is a horrifying and party unpleasing honesty. Mm. Like, wow, that went very badly. Yeah. <laughs> I just see how that feels. Yeah. You know? I one of the great sort of American shorthands for everything is best life now. Mm -hmm. It's their it's the, uh, televangelist Joel Osteen coined the term about um, 20 years ago, which makes me feel very old. Um, but since then, almost everybody just started reaching for it as the gold standard. How did you know you were really living your life? And in a pandemic, no one could say, I'm living my best life now. <laughs> and so we need, it has been hard then um, to replace it with some other kind of admission. We don't always want to reach for worse life now, but sometimes we're not super far off. <laughs> so I, um, I think the first bit is honesty and just, and, and like you can always tell when someone doesn't feel like the cultural script allows for honesty because you could even honestly just I, it helps me when i listen to it in my own voice if you were like even your first question where you're like how are you and i was like blah, 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 blah. <laughs> <laughs> your voice gets all crazy at the end because you're like trying to like you're trying to land a plane and then you feel like you're going to play english because <laughs> you don't want people to feel sad and so i think i think it's just showing us the weight of our cultural scripts that prevent us from being like this year was one of the hardest of my life just let it sit for a minute without immediately trying to take it back. Do you think we're given space and allowed to do that in church, for example? Oh, yeah, I know Canadians have our own problems about the deep politeness mm -hmm. and the desire to be like, oh, just swim in shallow end. <laughs> this is over here. That's my song called Shallow End by Kate Bowler. Uh, <laughs> I think politeness will kill us right now. I really do. I think people have lost so much more than they know how to say. And if we have a thicker language for grief, we will then even be able to know how to name, if we can name our losses. And we've all had losses. I've had three church friends die in the oh. last uh, three, four months. And they're gone. I didn't see them. Oh, I haven't yeah. seen them for two years, except yeah. on a little Zoom yeah. screen, right? Yeah. But, but when we go back to church, finally, they won't be there. And all of us collectively yeah. have those experiences. And, and I wonder if church will be the place that will allow us all to, yeah. to express that. Maybe well, we don't need to buy our pastors or devotional. <laughs> <laughs> Here, please, do more of us. <laughs> you could be super depressing. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think we could do? I mean, I'm just thinking of the way that we allow ourselves those community moments. It's very hard. Um, yeah, there's there's a moment in the sermon. There's the terrible... You know, we don't always do the passing of the piece, but what are you no. going to be like? This is terrible. <laughs> you know, one three second interval. Right. <laughs> you wrote in your book about joy not erasing pain. So, can you walk us through that idea of it? Why is it good to lean into pain occasionally? Yeah, I guess. Well, because all of this is like a, a sense of it's sort of just trying to name a continuum of precarity, right? That lovely word, like, a, my God. If Jerry Buller, my dad historian will hear, he'd be like, it's from the Latin. <laughs> it's, it's the feeling of something that's given that could be taken away, which is a horrible feeling, but we felt last couple of years our own contingency. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry about your friends. Mm -hmm. that's, but that, that's been reviewed right across the board. I see people know that they've had the same experience. Yeah. yeah. And our loves are so particular because mm -hmm. there's never grief in general. Mm -hmm. There's just the weight of love. Mm -hmm. I um, I think if I I guess the more I start trying to imagine precarity is like a spectrum that there's moments where we feel really kind of invincible. Like last summer, I I'm terrible. I feel like I just be like bad things keep happening to me very randomly. I mean, there was the almost death and the whatnot. But like I was on a walk and I was bitten by a poisonous copperhead snake recently, you know, a couple months ago, and 
And then I was in the, I was in the emergency room. And it's like apparently kind of a big deal. And this I, was in North Carolina. It was, don't worry. <laughs> and oh my gosh, it was the nicest thing. Yeah, they're clownless, right? Where they all come in the balls and the right stone and the whatnot. And that's horrifying. Um, <laughs> but I was randomly just a block from my house in grass that was this tall, mm -hmm. bitten by a poisonous copperhead snake. And then I thought it was, um, yeah. Uh, anyway, so then I had to rush into the emergency room and I had to yell, I've been poisoned, which was so funny. And then they rush you in because it's a big deal. And then I knew it was a big deal when the doctor was looking at me for a long time. And they, they like mark your leg with Sharpie of how much it has traveled up your leg. I like all the nursing people, right? Like, of course they mark it with Sharpie. Like, how would we know? <laughs> I don't want to have you take the other one. And, um, <laughs> And then there was kind of a long silence and the doctor was like, you'll keep the leg. I was like, well, thank you. I'm so glad. And my brand continuity is not special. I meet with every sorrow. Um, so there's moments where we feel just like the, the one, the unluckiest person in the whole world. And in that moment, there's like, we get to name our own ridiculous fragility. And then there are other moments where we feel stupidly, joyfully invincible. And then we have a minute to feel wind in our sails and try something that makes us feel a little courageous and, and also just let go of the idea that the world is hard just for a minute. And I find just trying to, trying to figure out where we are in our own sort of scale of precarity helps me. Am I feeling more invincible or am I feeling more fragile? And in that kind of continuum, have more grace then for myself and what I have to give and then allow myself to need more or give more depending on on that spectrum but I do find in all of it that for some reason joy really kind of cuts through the noise of pain in a way that all of our like stuff about happiness doesn't tend to and probably if happiness is a sort of like small accounting of contentedness that's supposed to add up to something. A lot of us don't get that feeling of putting money in the bank, the emotional bank. So sometimes we just kind of have to go right for joy. Like this, I, I, right after I found out I, I had a surgery coming up and it was very, it was a really scary one where they weren't sure how much liver to resect. And if they resected too much, then I would either die in the operating table or I would die after, or they would leave too much cancer. And, there were so many sort of horrifying. Mm. I just, it was, you know, when like something so bad, you can't totally wrap your brain around the edges of it. So there's a lot of just trying to hold it, but it felt so blurry. And um, I got this news. And then the next day I had a dumb work trip and I was too tired to cancel it because I was so overwhelmed. And I got off the plane and my friend Joe from Winnipeg, this hilarious septum piercing and his, his band from here, I think it was called Serrated Scalpel. He's a professor and I loved him. It's just this little band t-shirt. And um, he just saw how wrecked I looked. And he was like, we have five hours. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I heard that the world's largest Ukrainian Easter egg is nearby. <laughs> so maybe it's Manitoba's deep love of really large statues. But his yeah. And a great gift to my life. But if you pick something dumb and wonderful, I find that it um, it it has a kind of it has a lovely both and quality, where you can be having the very worst day of your life, but also hosting like a ketchup taste test party, <laughs> and it feels like it lands in the same place where you're where you're somehow human again. So I'm a big fan of dumb joy, only because it's. So I feel it's a not a bad it's not a bad habit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so before we go to Q and A from the uh, from the guests here today, back to your book. When you started writing the book, did you end up in the place you thought you would end up in when you started, or did you have a journey through the devotionals as well? Yeah, I guess I thought I was trying to write about time because I've always been really worried about dying early. Mm -hmm. So I, like, I should really try to understand how time works and like what makes a time feel time feel worth it. Like what what would a good bucket list? I was trying to figure out all the checklisty feelings. Mm -hmm. And um and then I just ended up writing about finitude, mm -hmm. about knowing that if things are really, really beautiful, if 
if we love and love and feel cracked open to the world, that actually there just won't ever feel like enough. Mm. And if that's never, if there's never like an arrival point for that, then like, how do I live in that beautiful, hungry, like the feeling I get when I look at my son, I think like I could starve to death. Mm. Like what a, what a privilege to love that much that I will never be enough. So I guess I've been thinking a lot about enoughness for a bit and wanting to maybe settle there instead of trying to fix it. Like our lives are a problem to be solved. Probably not. I'm sure people here would like to ask some questions too. John, are you nearby? In your beautiful baritone voice. <laughs> <laughs> He's also going to DJ the dance after. <laughs> and now for a slow jam. <laughs> <laughs> so I will remind everybody watching on YouTube as well that you can ask questions just by writing them in the chat. I have my cell phone here and I'll take those. And anybody here who has a question, just put up your hand and I will ominously approach you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got a pretty loud voice. Uh, my name's Phil. I am a man. I identify <laughs> as such. And, and I'm curious when I look around the room, there appears to be a dearth of other token males. And, and I'm curious, quite seriously, why do you think that is? Maybe you can write a new book about it and sell it to the masses, I don't know. And the other thing is, I, I listen to a lot of podcasts, and this is a compliment to you. I like the preface. <laughs> don't be like, don't worry. Yeah, no, no, no. I, and, and, and I listen to them, and then the host of, or the hostess, whichever is most PC these days, will we'll say something to the guest and it's like this mutual admiration society syndrome and and i and i it doesn't make me want to projectile vomit but it makes me <laughs> sort of sort of ill because if, if somebody says some feckless word or phrase and the other person oh i love that you know or i order I diet Pepsi at a restaurant and the service is that's awesome. Well, no, it's not awesome. Awesome is the second coming of Christ, right? So, so I, but when I hear you say to John, I'm sorry to hear about the loss of your friends, I sense sincerity and I commend you for it. So, just for those watching at home, uh, <laughs> the first question from the gentleman in the audience related to uh, him looking around and noticing that there was a dirt of men in the audience here tonight, and just wondering if Kate could speak to that. His second point was that he mentioned that while listening to podcasts, he sometimes finds that they turn into a bit of a mutual admiration society, lacking in sincerity. Whereas when Kate made a comment about John's loss, uh, it felt heartfelt, and he wanted to commend her for that sincerity and that honesty. That's amazing. <laughs> On the piece about uh, women, I think that part of the, to, to me, part of this is, is the heart of one of our questions that we have of vulnerability is who is allowed to wrestle with some of the more tender questions of honesty and pain and how to be a person. And I know a lot of that work typically goes to women. And so I do find that, uh, so the most, uh, in, uh, across social media, depending on which platform you're on, it's, it's not always women, but that very often it's, uh, it's um, an opportunity to be uh, a little less saddled with all the work of being perfect, which usually for women is uh, much more outwardly performed. You can tell anytime there's a family gathering, who's going to bring the salad, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So all the um, sort of bonus work is often the work of gender in this case. So I do kind of find that language around vulnerability is one reason, especially why women gather around some of the resources I like to make. Um, but my other demographic is older professor dudes. <laughs> so um, I, I'm usually the only woman in a room of older <laughs> professor dudes. Um, but I uh, thank you for your compliment about um, sincerity. I'm, I'm really, I, I love it when we can be careful with the language that we use for one another's loss 
And I am such a sensitive person that when other people were trying to fix me in my pain, all I really wanted to hear was that they, um, that they could be a witness to the reality of my life without trying to rush in. So that's, that's a hope I have for all of us, especially those of us who are trying to rebuild connection after the pandemic. We have a hard hitting and very personal question from Diane on YouTube. Do you have a favorite musical? If yes, what is it? <laughs> it's so funny. Other than large statues, musicals are one of my favorite things. So, but I am a, such a pushover. I just love everything I've recently seen. So I just got to see with my own human eyes, Hugh Jackman do the music man. <laughs> and when he turned his face, everyone, because with his beautiful, gorgeous, charismatic face, you could tell the audience went, oh, it's just a moment of collective gas. And then we all just started clapping and hadn't done anything yet. So I guess I just like Hugh Jackman is where the story works. So, sorry, sorry about that. Do we have any more questions from the audience? Yes. Hi, Diane. What can you do to remind yourself to stay in the moment and yeah. everything around you? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and and to stay in the moment can be the sort of like we get from people like stay in the moment. I'm sorry, you have diphtheria. Stay in the moment. <laughs> I don't know what diphtheria is. I'm just gonna look at all the nurses in the room. Like, is that how bad is it? Um, <laughs> I think because it is, it's one of the great, I mean, it's, it's, the, it's the, 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 the hope is that all of a sudden the future and the past can pour into this one feeling and it'll feel for a second like enough. But so often it's used in our culture as like a weapon that if we really lived in the moment, we wouldn't feel the, the pain and the weight of an incomplete life. So I find be present to be one of the trickier places for me to stay. Because I, I did have a... A thing that I'm trying not to do anymore was I had this sort of like middle distance way of thinking about my life. Like I'd be on this beautiful hike and then I'd be planning a thing that was six months from now. And I would just sort of, and I'd never actually I'd end up in the parking lot and be like, well, it must've been nice. <laughs> so I, I guess what I try to do is give myself permission to kind of dip back and forth between the past and the future. And then every now and then just try to remind myself to rest. Like, on the worst day, like a bad hospital day, what's actually really lovely is not to be in the present. Mm -hmm. It's to be in the past where every good thing that I love has already happened. Mm -hmm. And that's like a, a place I like to go. And then sometimes when things are lovely, then I can just, then the future all of a sudden is mine. And isn't that, gosh, making plans? What stupid privilege. Mm -hmm. So, but the rest of the time when I can't do either, then um, I do this dumb thing where I try to feel the peak moment of the day and that moment where it sort of gets like that taffy feeling. And oftentimes it's like a friend or someone else or like a song that like pulls us into it. And then I just try to, cause I'm not good at getting there. So I just try to let myself go. And normally right now it's my pirate kid and everything he does is for no reason. <laughs> and that kind of helps me undo the sort of momentum of the day. But I'm not great at it. And when you figure it out, let me know for real. We have a question from Angela from London, who says, I'm in love with your books. Oh, I'm still nice. struggling with faith. Have been for the past 10 years. Mm -hmm. What do you suggest could help? I struggle with where God is in pain. Where God is in pain? Was that it, John? Yes. Because there is a feeling of being abandoned, right? So we're trapped in bodies that don't. That's what you were saying, John, before about like your pain is your own in a way that is probably the most isolating feeling in the world. At St. Mary's Academy, they used to make us memorize poems. And one time when I was being wheeled in for surgery, I started remembering this terribly dark poem that has like a, and one by one, we will all file on through the narrow aisles of pain. And like narrow aisles is a great way of feeling like it filters us down. So I think part of it is in knowing that the, the loneliness is real, but the aloneness, like the big cosmic aloneness. I do really believe that, that God's A game is the suffering and that there, 
and that we can pray for the great miracle, which is that when we're in the middle of pain, we'll still get a flicker of being loved. And for me, it's always right after I get wheeled in is my scariest moment and nobody can be with me. And the surgical theater is always absolutely freezing and they start, it's weighted, right? Every blanket, every whatever, and I'm terrified. And the great miracle for me is at that moment, someone always grabs my hand. And I think we can just really hope and pray for the great miracle that God and others, even especially in the midst of our pain, will show up. Thank you for that. Okay. Hi, I work in a hospital as a chaplain. Oh, bless you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I'm, I'm wondering, as someone who has spent time in hospitals, what advice you have uh, for people who work in that setting, uh, and, and even anybody who is journeying with somebody who's, yeah. who's in the hospital, uh, to help them uh, to find acceptance for their loss and for their yeah. pain. And also, on the flip side of that, um, what do you want people who have been working in healthcare for the last mm. few years or for longer than that, who have given so much? Uh, what do you want them to know when it feels like they are not doing enough? Or yeah. Not doing? yeah. So, this is a question from somebody who works as a chaplain in a hospital who's wondering what advice Caitlin would have for those who are either working in that capacity or going through that kind of experience as well, whether it be as a patient or someone else. And I will just ask you to remind me of the second point. Uh, yeah, what, what does Kate want for people who work in healthcare to know? Uh, they don't feel like they're good enough. And what does Kate want people yeah. who work in healthcare to know when they just don't feel good enough? Well, first of all, thank you so much for your work in chaplaincy. That is, I mean, what a weird liminal space. You're like a witness, you're like a witness at a wedding in a way, hmm. in this great big before and after in someone's life. And I'm sure you see like the whole unraveling and the big and the great, horrible, wonderful privilege of vulnerability in that. And then of course the terrible burden <laughs> of being that person. Um, every time we're up close to somebody in the feeling of that, like, like the thin place of their life, it does feel sort of like a, a death and a miracle is to me in the same moment. I, and similarly to your, to your comment about the, the great like weight of what healthcare workers have been through in the last couple of years. I of course do not know from experience. I've done a few podcast interviews with some incredible people who've really, who talked a lot about, um, like I'm just thinking of the Christy Watson interview I did, who is a, an amazing nurse who also dealt with, uh, just she rushed in and volunteered in the worst of the pandemic in the UK. And she talks and writes about the great cost of caring and um, how, how especially the perfectionism of how quickly medicine must work and the actual checklists that keep people alive simultaneously communicate to people that every good act and sacrifice will never amount it will never like fill up the great chasm which is everyone else's pain uh so i probably healthcare workers are probably the great the, them, and they're like the great vocational question right is how do we so in, in every in every profession we have like an educator a social worker any any kind that work, that asks us to care and it's always the reason why we went into something in the first place. But then simultaneously always be the reason why it breaks our heart and we we feel tremendous shame for any boundary that we might put up around it. So knowing though that, that their precious lives, their efforts and their acts are always feeling like sort of starfish thrown back in the ocean. You know what? I, I actually got a really good answer on this like a couple weeks ago. I'm just pointing at you now. Um, <laughs> It was, um, so Justin Welby is the Anglican using words of being in charge of something. He is the Archbishop. Thank you, John. He's the Archbishop of Canterbury. I'm going to my embarrassment when that goes away. And, I, and I, we were talking about what, how do you keep giving in the face of um, an insurmountable loss when you know that your acts will never be enough. And he was talking about how ridiculous it is to then take on a job where suddenly it's your responsibility to pray over a mass grave or something in which the, the chasm is so deep that you can't even see the bottom of it. 
but you know you need to stand there. And um, he said he asked a friend who worked in a refugee camp what they do, when every day it will never be enough. And he said, um, he's like, at first, um, if you are given a great deal, then you, you can give a great deal. But if you are given very little indeed, then every night I rail against God for not giving me enough. And then I thank God for the small privileges of doing it all. I thought that was a lovely tension of being able to like mourn the fact that, that there was not enough today. And, some, and somehow we, we continue. So that was Justin, that was me. He's very good. He's very good at his job. <laughs> I'm sure he really needs that working endorsement. <laughs> Somewhere in Winnipeg, there's a woman who's pretty restful. <laughs> Speaking of women, uh, Doreen, he's, he's watching today. <laughs> <laughs> Look behind the screen. <laughs> and our special guest, <laughs> uh, Doreen and Dave would like to welcome you back and ask what places are you wanting to visit while you're here? What places feel most rejuvenating? Oh my gosh. Well, like any good Winnipegger, I'm immediately taken to the floodway to see <laughs> the water levels. <laughs> And then I'm told when hanging worm season will come soon. <laughs> and I got to be here for Fluffgate. Gosh, I love them. I'm so happy. No, really, I mean, honestly, my very favorite thing about Winnipeg really is like it is it is the joyful, wonderful, thrilled with everything people who make fun out of everything. So yeah, my favorite thing is um is they tell me exactly every bit of what they suffered throughout the winter, how long the spring was, how dirty the roads are, what's going on with the potholes. And I feel like I belong. <laughs> so that is that is my favorite. Also for me, for me it's great. <laughs> Are there any other questions in the room? Yes. It's more of just a comment. I just wanted to say, Kate, that I I do listen to all your podcasts and I look forward to them and they're usually very fast paced and so on lots of energy in them but in the one you had with Justin Welby there were a lot of silences as well and I felt that the vulnerability that both of you exhibited in that interview or I mean that podcast it, it moved me because the silence was sacred there was so much being said the silence and um it's when I go back to <laughs> yeah. So this was a comment about the podcast that Kate uh, did with Justin Bobby, where uh, the audience member mentioned that Kate's podcasts are normally full of energy and very fast paced, whereas this one, there was a lot of silence and a lot of vulnerability apparent. And we wanted to comment on how much that spoke to her as well and the feeling of grace associated with that. Most of the podcast episodes we taped started really at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, so, so much of the kind of connections that we've all been forced to make have been mediated in some way. And I think what felt so lovely about just being able to sit across is you sort of feel the weight of other people's mm -hmm. witness and pain. And then you get a second to settle into it. I think that always feels like the Chelsea, my best friend who is sitting right here and I just, We'll point at her a lot. Um, but we say a lot of, I will be a witness to your life. And we often say it when someone's doing something really dumb. Um, <laughs> but that is the feeling when you get to sit with someone is, let me be a witness to your life. In a palace. Yeah. In a, in, in a palace. <laughs> he lives in a palace. Yeah. And that part was very cool. Yeah. And I was very nosy. It's like, what's behind here? <laughs> I've grown up in the Mennonite context, and yeah. so I'm drawn into what you have to say about suffering and grief. I'm leaning into that, but I'm wondering how might we reconcile the necessity to lean into suffering and grief and make space for it? And how would we reconcile that with kind of the Mennonite's tendency and maybe you know sometimes obsession to identify and try to become uh, the suffering person? Like, um, mm -hmm. like the super martyrdom story, yeah. mm -hmm. the endless coffee table books about how sad it was. Yeah, yeah, yes, right. 
so, like this very minute question. <laughs> so this was a question uh, from a person in the audience who grew up within the Mennonite faith about uh, the kids' comments about leaning into suffering and as well, and how particularly in the Mennonite context. Um, sorry, the, you said it much more eloquently than I wrote. Um, our, our tendency and perhaps sometimes I obsession to identify or, or pay attention to the suffering of Christ. Right, our tendency and sometimes obsession with identifying <laughs> with the suffering of Christ, which as a team, so <laughs> very much understand. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. 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 I didn't grow up Mennonite, so I didn't. I didn't grow up with the martyr's miracle. You know, I didn't grow up <laughs> with, with that kind of thing. But but I absorbed it. Certainly, yes. Um, there, there's a, a concept I learned called uh, sandpapering your guts, which is if I don't feel bad enough, something's wrong, and so I got I got to do it even worse because. Oh. The war in Ukraine, the shooting in Uvalde, yeah. just just name all the horrors. That that's sort of a litany on a Sunday morning in a Mennonite church. And could we feel even worse now than we did before we came because of these things? And and you should. They're terrible things. But but there's this tendency to think I should even feel worse than I do. Or anyway, that's mm -hmm. my little test going. <laughs> Yeah, I think too. I mean, it, I think any any people or individual or profession who identifies primarily with suffering often feels that tension, especially too when overlaid with a Christian narrative. Is in the end, um, we so we so all need to be the one that's saved, and not the one. That, yeah, the, the the tendency to glorify suffering or to to worry that if we're not so fully attuned with suffering that we're missing the great story is also very tempting. In, in those moments, I honestly usually find it very helpful to sort of study the Christian habits of people who have really painful jobs, but who, who need the sort of the weight of joy to continue that long faithfulness. So I, yeah, Gary Haugen is one of my favorite people. He runs IJM. It's this it has like 1,200 staff. It's a, an enormous global organization in the world that works to end human slavery. And the way they pattern their work week to me is a testimony to this. How do we how do we draw up close to suffering without putting ourselves on the cross? Is a, I think a really powerful tension you're pointing to. And so often that was most of my thoughts about joy I got from Gary, because he decided that the only way to actually be the kind of going up close to the edge of other people, organization, and person he wanted to be was to infuse his life with so much of the other truths of being a person that we are that we are somehow good. But like the specifics of our joys and sorrows and foods we like and clothes we love wearing and the texture and the animals we pay too much attention to. But that also, those details are also just as important as our ability to be close to the the painful friend or to identify ourselves as not just being theological winners but yeah but thank you for being on the theological loser team though i do really <laughs> cherish that in a culture of, of endless theological winners i can tell you that there's not a lot of bestsellers on this side so maybe we could have a few more <laughs> speaking of that uh, julie was wondering what christian denomination resonates most strongly with your own personal beliefs <laughs> well, I, I teach. I teach in a, a seminary, so we we have pastors. It's mostly pastors who are the students, so they represent a really wide variety of denominations. And so, um, I actually, it's so we sort of get the theological buffet table, um, <laughs> and I have to give lectures. And they're like, "What do you really think?" And I'm like, "I can't tell you, <laughs> not until the end." Um, but I, uh, I think during different things, I want to learn. I feel. Uh, I mean, from when I want to love the world again, love the earth again, I love the United Church of Canada, frankly. When I want to feel like healing is possible, I really like Pentecostals. When I want to feel like someone could build my house and show up, I want Mennonites. <laughs> yeah, I, um, when I want someone to like put oil on my forehead and put a weight of hand, like the weight of hands, after I'm so scared, then I, I like anybody with a clerical collar because they're 
because they know what to do. Isn't it so nice to be around people who are like, they've got a job. <laughs> Put that carpal collar in the gym bag. <laughs> um, American and Canadian denominations don't line up very well, so I often find them a bit mismatched. But I think part of teaching at a seminary has taught me that for different stages of life, certain faith traditions are have sort of gems. We do have a host who can't turn off right now, properly. <laughs> um, we do have time for one more question. If anyone has one to close this down. The big historical book, the last one, is that the one? Yeah. And uh, the book is called The Yeah. Totally. Sorry. Yeah. And this was a question about speaking to the topic of Kate's PhD. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, I got very interested in the idea that God wants to reward you because of Winnipeg, because they put up a traffic light on the perimeter, and I was really mad about it. Um, and then I thought there was a warehouse empty on Sunday morning, but it was Canada's largest megachurch. And I told everyone in a very snotty voice, that is for Americans. And I was convinced that not in Canada would you have a story about, about individual lives being able to show that they have health and wealth and happiness and that's part of the primary testimony of god's goodness and at first i was very condescending about it i was like that's ridiculous who would believe that and when i get like that i am my historical brain clicks in and then i get very curious and so i spent about 10 years traveling around canada and the united states interviewing first televangelists which are kind of harder to sympathize with because they very often have sort of all the caricature stuff they got a jet or a gorgeous house or to have sort of every reason for it to be easy to explain why someone would have that theology. But then I spent so long with people at miracle healing rallies, people who wanted a sense that God, God's goodness could be seen, felt, and touched. And that in that, I learned that we're all sort of caught in this same sort of show and tell cycle often with our lives. And I found that to be at first something I was positive I didn't have any kind of relationship to. And then when my life came apart, I realized how much that had been a part of my expectation for my own life. So I, I find that it's always like a book found with me, that it's something that I've studied a lot and I feel like it has real limitations to that belief. And simultaneously, I'm so deeply sympathetic toward because I see it in my own life every day. Thanks for asking. Lovies, thank you for doing this with me. That was ridiculous. Thanks. And John, you're a delight. Yeah, thank you. It was great to meet you, but it's great too. I like too that you're just gonna pop out. No, he's got a piece a musical presentation that he's working on. Nobody wants to hear this. <laughs> So thank you both so very much for the conversation tonight, for being so open and for sharing us with us. And thank you all for just being here and for all of your questions and thoughtfulness as well. It's so very appreciated. Uh, this video will remain live on YouTube as well, I say, speaking to those on the internet. Uh, so please do feel free to revisit it or share it with any who are unable to be here tonight. Uh, the first few minutes, we had some tap sound difficulties, which was just my introduction. So please just imagine that I was saying very, very nice things about the next panels <laughs> and then the rest should be perfectly good. Uh, we're almost physically present here tonight. We're now going to move along to the signing portion of the evening. So we'll ask you all just to remain seated for one moment while we transport Kate across the store. <laughs> or if you just want to hug me, I'll let you have a She will dramatically appear at the table just beside her. <laughs> and at that point, you may feel free to line up to the book sign. We have books available at the signing table. We have books available at our cash desk. So please do visit one of those locations. You can get a book signed before you pay for it. Just please pay for the book before you actually <laughs> the uh, I should also point out that the store is technically closed now. 
Uh, so those gathered here, rest assured, we will not be kicking you out. You can stay here while the signing is taking place. We just very humbly ask that you just remain in the center of the store as all the other areas of the store have been closed down. But rest assured, you will not have to leave here without a sign, without a signed book, if that is what you desire. But thank you all once again so very much. And please join me one final time in giving a very warm round of applause. <laughs>